It's a great pleasure to see this uh, wonderful crowd here. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us. Uh, before I begin, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Silex Okanagan peoples and to say how, mu how much we enjoy the educational partnership that we have with our Okanagan Nation partners. It's a foundational piece of our UBC campus. So uh, this is the third year I've had the opportunity to stand up and introduce a new president. <laughs> I just thought I'd get that off my chest before I go any further. Um, I, am, I am absolutely confident you will not see me here again in the near future. As uh, anyone who uses social media knows, Professor Ono really needs no introduction. Uh, he's an avid Twitterer or tweeter. And, uh, but just let me take a minute, uh, not to talk about him, but to just tell you where we are on the Okanagan campus, because really, uh, this is a campus that's changing year by year. Uh, we have our highest enrollment ever. Uh, we are now over 8,600 students. Um, we're delighted to have our largest ever population of Aboriginal students. Uh, well over 400 self-declared students, which we know that means there are a lot more on campus who have not chosen to declare their status. Uh, we have our largest international student cohort, almost a thousand students representing more than 90 countries. What's really exciting about all of this is that we're attracting excellent, excellent students from across Canada and around the world and that we know that about 60% of our graduates stay in the region. That's an enormous influx of talented people who are choosing to come here and help us build the community that we all want. The students on our campus, our campus do come literally from around the world and they're going to make an enormous difference here in our region. So what's driving them to choose to come to UBC here in the Okanagan. Well, we're offering some extraordinary programs and I'd just like to tell you about two that we've actually launched this year. The first is our new Bachelor of Media Studies. This has been developed through extensive consultation and working with the local tech sector companies, including Disney Interactive and Bardell Entertainment and others this new program is tailor-made to meet the needs of the tech and digital media community right here in the Okanagan. It's really going to be a helpful stream to bring the talent that we want here in our community. Another new program which we've launched this year and which, of which I am uh, enormously proud and excited for our academic community is that we have expanded a co-op program that's existed for a long time in our Faculty of Management and our Faculty of Engineering. And thanks to our Dean Roger Sugden, who is here, that program is now available campus-wide. So this is a first for UBC to have a campus with co-op available to everybody. Or professional programs, we offer, of course, the professional stage and training for nurses and, and the others. It's going to be a game changer. We're doing it in partnership as we do everything with our community. So we're looking to you to partner as hosts for our co-op students and to be the beneficiary for your new employees of hiring UBC students who've already got their foot on the door and who understand the world that they're going to be working in. It's going to be a great new program here. We're absolutely thrilled. And if you want any more information, Roger's right here. Um, and you all know how to reach me and where our campus is and we can connect you with students. But now I'm delighted to introduce Professor Santa J. Ono, the 15th President and Vice Chancellor of UBC. He comes to us from the University of Cincinnati where he served as President from 2012 to 2016. He's also held senior administrative roles prior to that at, at UC and also at Emory. He's served in uh, other capacities and done his research at University College London, Johns Hopkins University. And his work, his scholarly work, is on the immune system, eye inflammation, and age-related molecular macular 
degeneration, sorry, a leading cause of blindness. Without further ado, please welcome Santa Ono. Well, thank you very much for being here this afternoon. It's absolutely great to see many faces that I already know. Um, I've had a chance to visit uh, Kelowna about uh, seven times already in about two months and had a chance really to, to get to know a number of you. And uh, we had a great announcement this morning uh, with about $3.4 million being invested from the province uh, into the research at UBC. Uh, so it is really great to be here. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, in the Okanagan, and uh, some of you may know that uh, when I was a finalist uh, for the position of President and Vice Chancellor, I took sort of a, a stealth visit uh, to Vancouver and to Kelowna, and I got to tell you that uh, my trip to the Okanagan was really the clincher in terms of my decision to, to leave a, a university and a city that I really loved, uh, uh, the Cincinnati as a city and, and the university, but coming here and drinking the ice wine was really the clincher. <laughs> In, in my evaluation of this opportunity. Um, ser seriously, you probably know that, um, that I was born in Vancouver when my father was a professor at UBC. And so really uh, coming back to UBC, which uh, when I was born, there was uh, no UBC Okanagan, but uh, um, coming back to UBC and to, to be able to support uh, the activities of both campuses was really sort of a dream come true. So I wanna thank you all for coming out uh, this afternoon uh, to hear about what's happening at the university. I'm incredibly excited and enthusiastic about the future of UBC and Okanagan, but also in Vancouver. Uh, before I uh, get on with some of my comments about UBC and the innovation economy, which as you know is really what we're going to be naming the uh, Canadian budget as we move forward, uh, I really wanted to uh, uh, shout, give a shout out to somebody who has really been instrumental as this campus enters its teenage years, in a couple of years, being 11 years old, somebody who has come here um, and uh, really uh, made it a priority to connect the faculty and students of the institution with the needs of the Okanagan and to Kelowna, and that is Deborah Buzzer. Let's give her a round of applause. You know, the beauty of British Columbia, the beauty of uh, this region um, is just one of its many attributes. Historically, the South Okanagan has depended for its prosperity on agriculture, especially fruit growing and wine production. I've talked a little bit about my fondness for the ice wine here. Tourism is having an increasing impact as the Okanagan brings in thousands of people every year from all parts of the world. And most recently, we've seen growth in real estate with a steady influx of new residents attracted by the amenities and the beauty of the region. But there are signs of other kinds of growth too, and I want to focus on those kinds of growth. According to the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, Kelowna is the most entrepreneurial city in the country. That is the best place to start and grow a business. Let's hear it for Kelowna. <laughs> to achieve this kind of status, you must have the right kind of infrastructure in place. And according to the Federation, Kelowna is exactly in that position and is taking the steps with the great leadership here to become an even more robust place for entrepreneurship. Let's hear it for the mayor, for all he's doing. Let me quote from the Kelowna Daily Courier, which reported the story just a couple of weeks ago. The writer, who might be in this room, cites the opinion of the manager of the Central Okanagan Economic Development Commission, who lists the components of Kelowna's economic infrastructure, including, quote, the highly skilled Kelowna workforce, Okanagan College, UBC Okanagan, air access through Kelowna's airport, a welcoming business community, and a quality of life that attracts entrepreneurs, workers, students, families, and retirees alike. And I can tell you when I was standing in the line at Tim Hortons, not that long, Deborah, 
uh, at UBC Okanagan, speaking to the students, many of them mentioned that it was the quality of the life, in addition to the quality of the education they're receiving, that has attracted them here. And they were from all over the world. And I'm sure that you're not surprised by that. The article goes on to point out something potentially even more significant. The city's growing capacity in connectivity, which provides, quote, massive internet capabilities for businesses that need it. That connectivity, says the article, has helped the Okanagan become home to more than, and this is staggering, 750 high-tech firms that have created 1.3 billion a year sector, a, a sector employing more than 7,500 people. That's pretty remarkable. 1.3 billion dollars a year. And some of you may actually have read that a number of different organizations, including Reuters and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times have remarked about the tremendous high-tech growth in British Columbia. And a lot of that has to do with what's happening here in the Okanagan. You may have read in the Wall Street Journal that there's a prediction that in the next five years there may be up to a million jobs connected to the high-tech industry that will be based here in British Columbia. So what's happening here in British Columbia and in Kelowna is attracting the attention of the most venerable business newspapers and magazines around the globe. Connectivity, high tech, and a highly skilled workforce, that's the future, and it's already here in Kelowna, and we're proud that UBC is going to be part of the very bright future of the Okanagan. These are the key elements in any plan to develop the prosperity and well-being of our population locally, regionally, and it will contribute to Canada's prosperity. And to derive the maximum amount of advantage from these ingredients, we need to think outside of the box. We need to bring new ways of thinking into the equation, look into the crystal ball of the future, and really as a partnership between the university and the community, the chamber and government officials, really think about how to align all of these ingredients to enhance the capacity for innovation that will undoubtedly be the competitive advantage for British Columbia over other parts of the nation, but also over other parts of the world. Now let me talk a little bit about the business of education because that's the business that UBC is in. And the spirit of innovation is very much at the heart of what we are doing both here in the Okanagan and in Vancouver and together with our partner and sister schools, colleges and universities today. We all get it. We get together as a group and we talk about our responsibility and our plan to build a foundation upon which economic prosperity for British Columbia and for Canada can rest. Let's first talk about undergraduate education, something that really has to be strong for the innovation economy. Things are very different from what they were just a decade ago or even two years ago. And innovation has transformed the very nature of teaching and learning. The best students demand that the way we teach is really at the penetrating cutting edge. When I was going to school, there was a professor on the stage, there were lots of students in the classroom. That sage to stage kind of paradigm has passed. And students have progressed far beyond being passive recipients of information from a PowerPoint presentation, which was the case when I was in school in the 80s. Today, professors at UBCO tend to be facilitators, partners with the students, creating the right kind of environment in classrooms and laboratories, in classrooms that don't resemble the classrooms that we studied in when we were in university. Courses in many areas, such as law, medicine, applied science, are often case-based or problem-based. And the research that's going on by our faculty is mission-based, requiring students to work collaboratively in teams to find solutions, sometimes going to a different part of the globe 
to join teams from other universities to try to address the most fundamental questions of the nature of matter or the nature of life. There are students at UBC that are participating in that kind of educational experience, the kind of experience that will be unforgettable, a experiential learning that will really equip our students to be very rapidly part of the knowledge economy. That's the kind of innovation that's occurring at UBCO and in Vancouver right now. Many of our instructors use what we call the flipped classroom approach. Students don't actually come to the class to passively absorb a lecture, looking at a professor right on a chalkboard, remember that? Or a PowerPoint presentation. <coughs> students now, in more and more of our classes, learn the materials outside of the classrooms in their home or in their residence halls, and they come to class ready with the fundamental information to really focus the valuable time in the classroom or in the laboratory or in the workplace to test what they learned with real life problems and questions that are presented to the group with the professor being the facilitator. Instructors of traditionally large classes now can determine exactly what their students know at any given time using technology. It's a little bit scary. I'm glad I'm not going to school right now, but you know, <laughs> professors can actually look and see whether you have grasped a concept or not. They can actually tell whether you're actually looking at a YouTube video and where you're stopping and how often you're actually cycling back until you get that concept. And that's something that UBC is really pioneering. And it's the kind of thing that the best students expect today. It's actually coming from the students. The students expect us to engage them more so they can be active participants in the learning process. But the innovations that are occurring in terms of how we teach go well beyond technology, go well beyond the flipped classroom kind of paradigm. For example, a student in the arts can now take a program in cognitive systems in which the participating units are philosophy, psychology, linguistics, and computer science. It wasn't like that when I was going to university. I learned from a biology professor. There were no courses or no opportunities to learn from faculty from three or four different faculties. Through the interrelated study of these fields, the student gains a comprehensive understanding of human cognition and learns to apply this knowledge to create intelligent artificial systems and also to understand the very molecular and cellular basis of thought, sort of the high-tech philosophy, if you will. A student in applied science can twin his or her studies in hydraulic engineering with a program in entrepreneurship so that he or she is prepared for the challenges of commercializing and monetizing her skills. That's what I want UBC to be moving into the future. Think about it. Real innovation in the workplace really comes at the intersection of two different fields. And the more we can bring science right up very close to business and commerce, the more likely we are as an institution of higher education or advanced education to be spark plugs for the economy to be the most effective entrepreneurs that we can be to create, create the products of the future. That's one role that universities need to play. And then, of course, there's the whole area of information technology. I've been spending a lot of time in Ottawa talking to the Minister of Science, Minister of Innovation. Just a few weeks ago, I had the privilege of speak, sitting right next to Bill Gates, talking to him about What's the secret sauce of Microsoft? Why has it been successful for so long? A lot of it has to do with being at the penetrating cutting edge of information technology that's finding its way into almost every sector. The huge expansion of digital tools has revolutionized the business of teaching and learning. 
Many courses now take a blended approach, mixing face-to-face -face presentations with online or video presentations, or even a foundational lecture from a star professor at an institution thousands of miles away. And why shouldn't that be the case? Students now have instantaneous access to vast electronic databases and require a sophisticated understanding of software tools to access and use that information. And all of our students moving into the future should be equipped so that they can plug in to the new technology of information technology. So you can see that innovation lies at the very heart of what we do to prepare our students for the world beyond our campus. I'll say that phrase again, to prepare the students for the world beyond our campus. That's what we should be focusing on. How can we structure what we do on our campuses so once they leave, they can go into your organizations and your companies and really innovate and serve as spark plugs for what happens in your corporations? And it's in this same spirit that universities are gearing up to meet the social and economic challenges that face society today. It's not just about can we make a competitive product, whether it's a smartphone or whether it's a biomedical device. It's also about preparing the next generation to solve the challenges that are affecting this nation and this world because it rests upon them to address that moving into the future. Canada, despite its great natural wealth and its industrial expertise, is unfortunately, looking at certain metrics, falling behind in terms of the productivity, competitiveness, and trained workforce we need to stay abreast of the competition. In other countries and jurisdictions are spending quite a bit of money in terms of how they educate, how they perform research, understanding that it really is the secret sauce to being competitive as a region or a nation. In global terms, we're in a period of economic stagnation as a nation, with the exception being British Columbia. And I think that that's not an accident. I think it's because of our investment and commitment to education research that British Columbia is an exception to what's happening across Canada. And we realize that the key to regaining our position as a nation, as a leader in the world, relies upon building an innovation economy. When you walk around Parliament Hill, when you go to the Prime Minister's office, when you go to the Minister of Science and Technology, but when you go even to the Minister of Infrastructure, they say the same thing. They realize that it's up to the universities. It's up to successfully creating a robust and competitive innovation economy for us to remain competitive so that we can build the new products, the new methods of production, the new markets for our goods. We get it here in British Columbia. We get it here in Kelowna. To respond to this challenge, as many of you know from watching the news, the government of Canada has recently launched two, I think, very progressive and insightful initiatives. A fundamental review of science, led by the former president of the University of Toronto and the former predecessor of mine, the former president of UBC, Martha Piper. A review of how we do fundamental science, understanding that it is the seed corn to innovation of the future. They have received extensive input from the University of British Columbia. Combine these two initiatives, the Science Review and the Innovation Conversation, aim to address how to best foster an innovation-based economy in the 21st century. And in doing so, they are asking fundamental questions about how we can remain globally competitive in terms of research, but also translating inventions into new products, new processes, that will really pave the way for Canada's prosperity and for new jobs here in Kelowna, in Vancouver, throughout British Columbia, and across the nation. The province of British Columbia is responding as a leader in this conversation. 
The British Columbia government is just as concerned to find ways of giving our economy a jump start, and I have enjoyed lots of conversation, lots of face time with the ministers and the premier herself, who are absolutely cognizant of the importance of doing this right for the future of British Columbians. It's for that reason that I am excited and convinced that British Columbia and UBC will lead the way in the innovation economy for this nation. Since 1998, the province has provided important matching dollars through something called a Knowledge Development Fund, the BC Knowledge Development Fund, to ensure that universities attract Canada Foundation for Innovation, or CFI funding, for research infrastructure. That investment from the province of British Columbia has been genius. We were just in a tour of laboratories at the Okanagan, Okanagan campus of UBC, and we saw some brilliant cutting-edge research on sleep apnea. We heard, we heard a faculty member there talk about what was necessary to bring cutting-edge instrumentation and infrastructure into that lab. And I'll tell you, sleep apnea and insomnia are major market areas, me included. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And having that kind of research here in the Okanagan is really critical because it could form the foundation for new drugs of the future. And what that faculty member said is incredibly important for us all to understand. He said, this laboratory and the research that stems from it would not have been possible without provincial funding that really led the way and paved the way for CFI investment at the federal level. Through this and other provincial programs, such as Genome BC and the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, UBC and our sister institutions in British Columbia have been able to build the kind of solid foundation that makes advanced research possible and paves the way for us to be a leader in innovation. The province has created its own blueprint for innovation, I think the best of its kind in Canada in the form of something called the BC Tech Strategy, announced earlier this year. Through grants and other financial incentives to employers and educational institutions, the British Columbia government hopes to stimulate applied research, create a highly skilled workforce through UBCO and UBCV and our sister organizations, and encourage job growth that is essential to the, to the expansion of the provincial economy. This is a key acknowledgement of the role that the tech sector is going to play in the province's economy for decades into the future. And as I hope you know, UBC understands its responsibility and is fully committed to doing everything we can to partner with the government and with the community to set the stage so that we can lead in Canada's innovation economy. As many of you know, we are already the second largest research institution in Canada. And Reuters has announced that we are Canada's number one innovative or innovation university. That's something to be, sure, to be excited about, isn't it? We are the number one innovation university in Canada. And we are the only Canadian university to be in the top 50 in the world. And I can tell you, that I will do everything I can to make sure that we remain one of the top 50 and, in fact, that we move up that league table in terms of innovation. There are now $600 million in research funding that go into the institution, 9,000 research projects across the university. And just to give you an idea of how important UBC is for the province, although there are a lot of different colleges and universities in this province, UBC conducts greater than 90% of all research, especially industry-sponsored research in the entire province. So UBC must succeed for the province to succeed. In 2016, UBC was the top university in terms of startup company creation among all universities in Canada and among the top few percent of all universities in North America. And we were number one among Canadian universities. 
So you can see UBC is not only significant for the province, UBC's success in many ways will dictate the success of the nation. Let me tell you some of the ways in which UBC is contributing to the innovation agenda. One of the most important is through our commitment to the development of research clusters. Many of you actually know and have been following on the news how it's very likely in this year's innovation budget that there will be large amounts of money doled out to research clusters. They will be driven by sectors, but they will require robust partnerships with educational institutions. And that's why I've been on Parliament Hill and speaking with people in the PMO's office so that they understand how important UBC is to the innovation budget. These are interdepartmental, intersector networks of leaders in particular fields who are brought together to investigate large problems with market potential that resist solutions from only one part, say the academic or the corporate sector. And that kind of cluster is what's really required for us to be world beaters in any of those areas. For example, we have a biodiversity group comprising members of our botany and zoology departments working together on something called adapting biosystems, working with corporations, figuring out the processes by which evolution affects different species in different ways, looking at things like the impact of global warming on speciation, but also on the integrity of our communities that we all call home. Another cluster has been formed by bringing together researchers from the Faculty of Forestry, Botany, the Michael Smith Laboratories, Biodiversity, and the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. They have formed a forestry and plant productivity group studying plant genomics and bioproducts from renewable resources. And all of you know that a forestry industry is very, very important to the economy of British Columbia. UBC will play a role in a cluster to make sure that we remain in the lead in that very important economy for this province. A third cluster that has brought scholars from a variety of fields together is one entitled Remembering and Commemorating Trauma. You might ask, why would you want to remember trauma? But if any of you know the after effects of uh, PTSD, and the cost of health care involved in taking care of those who actually put their lives in harm's way for our nation, you can understand why it's important to have a cluster looking at that. Taking its clue from the work of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Committee, scholars in this interdisciplinary cluster are interested in the impact of traumatic events, not only post-war, but also within society, looking at individuals, looking at society, looking at marginalized groups within society. It actually costs the economy an enormous amount to look after individuals that are suffering from any kind of trauma. And it actually gets even more serious if you look at the economic impact of lost working hours. Now this cluster is made up of researchers from history, social work, creative writing, critical studies, psychology, indigenous studies, and many other faculties and departments at both campuses. An important aspect of this research is its examination of the ways in which our responses to trauma can be used to create new therapies, new medications, that can actually, hopefully, even impact on truth and reconciliation in this nation, a major issue that we have to deal with moving into the future. And my last example illustrates the clusters of faculty members based in our institutions working with members of the corporate community can break through disciplinary barriers and engage people in innovative ways, leading to both knowledge creation and knowledge translation with market potential so that new discoveries for health and well-being for our citizens can actually come from this collaborative process. From this, I hope it's clear that our commitment as an institution to innovation does not stop within our campuses. 
as a major research university, one of the top 31 in the world, one of the top six public universities in North America, the University of British Columbia supplies both the technical know-how and the talent to keep our industries here in Kelowna and across the nation qualified so that those industries can remain at the forefront of world markets. We contribute to the development and evolution of new companies, products and services, and create the new technologies that industry needs to remain productive and competitive on the global stage. UBC students have the benefit of the largest co-op education program in the Western world, Western Canada, gaining invaluable work experience before they graduate and facilitating the exchange of knowledge between industry and academia. The students are not there just to learn. The students are the glue between the university and the company. UBC can lead and will lead in work integrated learning as a springboard for our future workforce. To further promote research industry collaboration, UBC's University Industry Liaison Office, or UILO, helps startups and spin-offs and provides the kind of network and know-how that enables researchers to bring their discoveries into the workplace. UILO is comprised of two distinct groups, the Sponsored Research Group and the Technology Transfer Group. Both groups are recognized internationally, negotiating, this is staggering, 2,500 research and development contracts and issuing hundreds of patents every single year. 2,500 research and development contracts, many of them with people in this room. One of UBC's most successful spin-offs is Westport Innovations, BC's largest clean tech company. The company engineers the world's most advanced natural gas engines and vehicles, reducing emissions and fuel costs, employing more than 500 people in British Columbia and over 1,100 in Canada, all with technology developed at the University of British Columbia. The company was initially built through close partnerships between UBC researchers, graduate students, co-op students, and lab facilities with the corporate sector and maintains extensive research partnerships with UBC to this very day. So the university is not just there to initiate an idea and to launch a startup. The university industry partnership has to be a long-lived partnership. You know, when Bill Gates sat, sat down next to me uh, at a lunch, and I asked him that question, as I said early on, what's the secret sauce of Microsoft? secret sauce. He said, you know, a lot of people think it's our internal R&D because the R&D effort in Microsoft is larger than that of many universities. And he said that's not the reason why Microsoft has remained competitive. It's because of its interaction with universities. And he said part of it is because of Microsoft's interaction with UBC. Some of you may know that Microsoft is very choosy. It will only partner with faculty members from 16 universities around the entire planet. To give you an idea, there are about 7,000 universities around the planet, and they chose 16, and one of them is the University of British Columbia. And um, hopefully that gives you an idea that even a company that's been around as long as Microsoft relies upon UBC and 15 other universities to remain competitive on the global stage. Collaboration of this kind between university research and even the most mature multinational Fortune 500 companies is becoming more and more significant to remain competitive. It is a synergistic, almost symbiotic relationship. It's a kind of collaboration that really <laughs> defines what we're calling the innovation economy for Canada. Let me give you an example close to home, here in the Okanagan. They're developing a 30-acre innovation precinct to accommodate productive, long-term engagement with industry and nonprofits. This will bring together industrial partners, including hopefully some of your companies, who want to draw on our research excellence 
to develop and test new products. This is a unique opportunity for this most entrepreneurial city in Canada to tap into one of the 30 greatest universities in the world. Earlier this year, UBC Okanagan signed an agreement with Avcor Industries from Delta BC, a leading supplier of integrated composite and metallic aero structures. The agreement is to develop a learning faculty, fa factory for advanced composites, which will integrate industrial production with learning and research. Drawing on the expertise of our faculty at both campuses and giving our students hands-on experiential learning. It's really, really revolutionary, this idea, and I hope you're excited about it here in Kelowna. I know that a number of people here today have been involved with this venture in one capacity or another and are keen to see it succeed, and I can tell you I will do everything in my power to support it moving forward, including going with Deborah and others to Ottawa to make sure they know about our plans. Indeed, indeed, this kind of partnership holds great promise, not only for the university and for you as our industrial partners, but also for the economy of the region, since such arrangements have a ripple effect, bringing training for students, creating manufacturing jobs in the private sector, and offering the promise of new industries and a diversified economy for the Okanagan, for British Columbia, and for Canada. But there is an added dimension to growing the innovation economy in southern BC through this partnership with the university. I recently had the pleasure of participating in a conference with the president of the University of Washington at which we explored the possibility of creating a broader tech corridor, one that spans the border between Canada and the United States. And we've referred to that as the Cascadia Corridor, which would bring together some of the finest minds in the continent at UBC and the University of Washington to create the kind of synergy that you find in the Boston, Massachusetts area and in Silicon Valley. This is not about a single institution. This is about structuring the research institutions and the companies and the government in this entire region in such a way that we can compete with other regions of the world. In conjunction with the University of Washington, we will relatively soon announce an innovative relationship that I think will really be a step change in our competitiveness as a region that will see the two great universities of the Pacific Northwest collaborating with each other in unprecedented ways, but not only with each other, but closely with giants such as Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Hootsuite, and the development of new tools and applications that will transform the economies of both the Washington State and British Columbia. And since that conference, UBC has been taking together with University of Washington and Microsoft, a fresh look at areas like biomedical engineering, digital media, with a view of optimizing our research capabilities through joint projects so that there is alignment between the province, the educational and research uh, sector, and the corporate sector. And if you would like to have conversations with me about ideas about how we can align with you, I can be contacted easily at UBC Prez on Twitter, or by email at presidentsoffice at ubc.ca. Please do not hesitate to contact me. So to close, the future holds great promise. That is, if we continue to keep uh, the eye on the prize, as some people say, if we keep innovating and keep to this plan where we are already leading as the number one innovation university in Canada, the dividends will be huge. I would say that the most important investment we can make to ensure the success of our plan is in the development of human capital. The education of a highly skilled, flexible, and creative student of the future. It's a cliche, perhaps, but the wealth of a nation lies in the capabilities and resourcefulness of the future generation. And the key to tapping those capabilities, that resourcefulness, the maybe naive innovation that really is the spark for great changes in the how humans actually approach problems, that really lies 
in the students that are in our universities today. Great universities like UBC must learn to continue to nurture and excite that generation, their capabilities, to encourage their imagination, to really help them develop leadership and entrepreneurial qualities because we will be depending upon their success in moving the nation forward. I'm speaking now not only about economic prosperity, but social prosperity too. We need to develop new ideas, not just in science and technology, not just in industrial production, but in meeting the social challenges also that will be a drain, if you will, on our future progress. We need to find ways to bring the First Nations fully into the circle of economic prosperity and to realize the potential in First Nations youth. We need more of them in our universities. We need to empower them because their success will be our success. And if there's anything that I do as president of UBC, it will be to make sure that we continue to lead as an institution in giving that opportunity to First Nations youth. We need to break the cycle of poverty and ill health in some of our big cities. We need to provide opportunity for those who are less fortunate. Innovation is needed not just only in STEM technologies. Innovation is needed in our society in general. I want to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to speak with you. UBC will be the economic spark plug for the regions, but also for Canada's innovation economy, I have no doubt. In the next decade, I predict, and I tweeted about this earlier today, and I believe it fervently, working together, British Columbia will be at the epicenter of Canada's innovation economy. British Columbia will not only be the most beautiful province in Canada, it will be the most innovative and most exciting and stimulating and robust economy in this nation. It is a privilege, it is an honor to serve you as UBC's 15th president. Thank you very much.